Good morning to you and welcome to the Cathedral Church of St. Luke and St. Paul to our online worship on this third Sunday in the season of Advent. We are so glad that you are with us. And as we all collectively are eagerly anticipating the coming of our King at Christmas and the second coming of our King in that final day, we come together now to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. So let's all stand and have our opening acclamation. Surely the Lord is coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And now as we are gathered before the Lord, let us offer our hearts to him that he might prepare us for worship. Let us pray together the collect for purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And as we stand, let us sing together.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, you sent your messengers, the prophets, to preach repentance and prepare the way for our salvation. Grant that the ministers and stewards of your mysteries may likewise make ready your way by turning the hearts of the disobedient toward the wisdom of the just, that at your second coming to judge the world, we may be found a people acceptable in your sight. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of God's word. Isaiah 65, verses 17 through 25. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy, and her people 
to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Now Psalm 126 said responsively by whole verse. When the Lord overturned the captivity of Zion, then we were like those who dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Indeed, the Lord has done great things for us already, whereof we rejoice. Overturn our captivity, O Lord, as when streams refresh the deserts of the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap with songs of joy. He who goes on his way weeping and bears good seed shall doubtless come again with joy and bring his sheaves with him. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. This is the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord the Gospel comes from the third chapter, beginning at the 22nd verse. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at the Anon near Salim, because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. The Gospel of the Lord. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, today may your word be preached with boldness, heard with attentiveness, received deep in our hearts, and obeyed in readiness. And we ask all this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
Amen, friends, and good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Hunter Myers. I'm the student ministry director here at the Cathedral Church, and it's such a joy to be with you today. I remember stepping off the bus to the sounds of shouting and great confusion. I hurried over to the line, I stood at attention, and immediately started sweating. Fort Gordon was already hot during the summer, and in our uniforms, we were just boil-in-a-bag teenagers. You see, back in the day, I wanted to serve in the United States Air Force. And so I joined a program in my middle and high school years called Civil Air Patrol, or CAP. Now, CAP as an organization actually predates the United States Air Force. It started as a civilian response to the German U-boats patrolling the Atlantic seaboard. Planes would go up and they would toss grenades out the window at surfaced U-boats in an attempt to sink them. But over the decades, Civil Air Patrol became a program to help young people like I was discern a call into the military and cultivate leadership. So before you could serve on staff in CAP or become an officer, you had to go through what we called encampment, which is our equivalent to basic training or boot camp. And a Marine I know who, who went through basic training at Paris Island described ba- uh, boot camp as a process that breaks you down in order to build you back up again into a soldier. And to be fair, my one week experience at Fort Gordon as a 13 year old does not uh, exactly resemble the process of full military basic training, but they do share a similar project. They take us, put us all on the same level through discipline, and then they begin to build us up to become proper cadets. For me, encampment was what I would describe as a leveling and then an elevating process. It broke me down to build me back up for a new purpose. And then with all of us in every seasons of life, we have seasons of preparation that break us down to build us up for a new purpose. As soon as you begin training for that race or prepping for the SAT or GRE or voraciously reading those parenting books or planning your big presentation, you begin to see just how much breaking down you need in order to start building towards your goals. That's what happens in seasons of preparation. And in the life of the church, Lent and Advent are our collective seasons of preparation. They invite us to consider who you really are, what you really want, and where your joy truly lies. And Advent, specifically the season we're in right now, challenges us to prepare for the kind of joy that only God can give. In fact, the collect for this Sunday, the the third Sunday of Advent, is all about what Advent preparation looks like. You can uh, read this along with me. It says, O Lord Jesus Christ, you sent your messengers, the prophets, to preach repentance and prepare the way for your salvation. Grant that the ministers and stewards of your mysteries may likewise make ready your way by turning the hearts of the disobedient toward the wisdom of the just, that at your second coming, to judge the world, we may be found a people acceptable in your sight. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit, you live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. So our colleague today acknowledges that God, throughout history, has sent messengers known as prophets to prepare a people for his salvation. It connects the story of God's work in the past to us here today, that the same God who sent his son Jesus is calling us to prepare for Jesus' return. But as we prepare for Jesus' coming this Advent, there's a problem, and an important and subtle problem, at work. It's a very old problem, perhaps the oldest problem. It's the problem of pride, the sin of pride. And pride will always be the enemy of joy. It's pride versus joy. Pride looks down on others, but you only find joy by looking upward and outward. Pride sees objects, not gifts, and joy not only sees gifts, but it sees the giver of every good gift. Pride leads to the city of man, and joy leads to the city of God. And if we walk down the path of pride, we'll never find true joy. Pride seeks yourself and your superiority, and if that's what you're seeking, then what you begin with is what you end with, and that's just yourself. And I'm wary to give specific examples of pride today because even something as seemingly as wonderful as feeding the sick, or sorry, feeding the the hungry or tending the sick, can actually be motivated by personal pride. Pride, in this sense, is deceiving, like bad breath. Often, 
Everybody knows you have it, but you don't realize you have it yourself. And in the language of the Bible, we can face our problem like this. How do I prepare for Jesus's coming without becoming a Pharisee? How do I prepare for Jesus's coming without becoming a Pharisee? That's an important question, and the question that our gospel text asks today. So I invite you now to open your Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 3, beginning in the 22nd verse. That's John 3, chap, uh, chapter 3, verse 22. So in this passage, as you're turning there, John the Baptist, the foremost of God's prophets, encounters the efforts of these people called the Pharisees. Now, I want to do something a little, a little dangerous here, so, so bear with me. I want us to develop a little sympathy for the Pharisees. Now, this could be dangerous for a number of reasons, because one of which is that Jesus' harshest words during his ministry were towards Pharisees. But it's also dangerous because of our own connotations with the word Pharisee. The word Pharisee in our common usage refers to someone who's self-righteous and holier than thou, guarding this pristine world from the filth of outsiders. So if you want to look for a contemporary equivalent of a Pharisee, just hop on Twitter. You'll see what I'm talking about. However, our friend Bishop N.T. Wright describes the Pharisees as people committed to a certain project. Unlike other religious elites back in John the Baptist in Jesus' day, who made the most of life under secular Roman rule, the Pharisees wanted to spur on God's coming kingdom and his promised salvation. The Pharisees reasoned something like this. If we do our part, if we become a holy people, then God will do his part and send his king and establish his kingdom and bring salvation. And when you read the story of the Old Testament, you can't help but understand why they reasoned like that. Over and over and over, you see the people of Israel failing to live into their covenant, into their relationship with God, and it had catastrophic results over and over. So the Pharisees committed to a project, to an effort of ordering the common people, giving them rules and discipline, structure to follow God's law, become holy, and in that sense, hurry up God's kingdom. So there's a real sense in which their project is sympathetic. Their efforts we can sympathize with. However, there were two important people who are conundrum to the Pharisees, John the Baptist and a man named Jesus. So looking at our gospel passage in John's third chapter, beginning in the 22nd verse, Jesus had just met privately with a Pharisee named Nicodemus, and it begins here in the 22nd verse. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John, that is John the Baptist, was also baptizing at Anon near Salim because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. So in this scene out in the wilderness, John the Baptist is, get this, baptizing, and because John had been in the wilderness calling people to repent and baptizing them, the Pharisees earlier had come to John and asked him if he was God's coming Messiah, his king. And John answered that he was not the Messiah, but his job, his role, his effort was to prepare the way for the Messiah. And what perplexed the Pharisees about John's ministry was that he baptized Jews and non-Jews. And you see this in verse 25, it says, Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew who was most likely either a Pharisee or a follower of the Pharisees over purification. In their culture, Jewish worshipers often used water to become ritually clean so they could worship in the temple. Only non-Jews were actually baptized and immersed in water to be converted, and even then they didn't end up with the same rights and privileges in worship as ethnically born Jews. But John, John the Baptist, he baptized non-Jews or Gentiles and Jews alike. John baptized everyone to prepare them for the gift that God was going to give all people, and John didn't want anyone to miss out. Continuing in verse 25, we can read, And they, John's followers, came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he's baptizing and all are going to him. So let's pause here because what's funny is that in the verse before, they were discussing and debating purification. But why don't they ask John in the next verse about purification? Well, because that's not what button the Pharisees were pushing. They pressed the importance of John's ministry, his efforts. It's as if they were saying, look, 
your ministry has competition. That, that prophet you were talking about and hung out with the other week, look at him. He's copying your technique. He's copying your message. And now everybody's going to him instead of you. In other words, the Pharisees were wanting to appeal to John's pride. But how did John, John the Baptist, understand his work and his ministry? Continuing in verse 27, John answered, A person cannot even receive one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase and I must decrease. So let's reconsider this scene again from John's perspective. John's hearing the conversation. He's hearing the debate and it's getting heated. But he turns away to focus on the people still waiting to be baptized. He knew what they were arguing about. He knew they were going to come and ask him a question. And sure enough, while he's baptizing, they come and they ask him, Teacher, you know the man who is with you over the river? The one you've been said you've been waiting for? Well, you should know that he's baptizing like you are, and now everybody's going to him instead of you. But John takes a breath. He looks at his friends, and he says, Everything everyone has already is a gift from God in heaven. In fact, you can't receive anything that isn't a gift from God. You know who I am, and you know how I said I'm not the coming king. My job was to prepare for his coming. If this was a wedding, I'm not the groom. I'm like the best man. (laughs) The groom comes for the bride, and the best man's job is to be happy and hype up the room when the groom comes. So now that the one I've been preparing for, he's come, how could I not but rejoice? God's gift is here. He must increase, and I must decrease. John the Baptist has seen years of preparation, years of effort, years of ministry out in the wilderness coming to fruition, and instead of clinging to his special role in it, he holds out an open hand, and he's ready to receive what God is giving new. For us, friends, the path of the Pharisees, the call of the Pharisees, is near and dear to our hearts our fallen hearts, because it's rooted in pride. Pride that my efforts earn me a seat at the table. Pride that as long as I do my part, God will do his part. Pride that if I could only climb a little higher or try a little harder or talk a little cleaner or be a little more successful or have a few more friends or be a little more reliable, then God could meet me. Then God could use me. Then God might give me his blessing. But friends, pride begins with what you end with yourself. And you'll never lead yourself to the joy of Advent. Advent calls us, all of us, to humility because, like John, only a humble heart can see that God has given his grace in Jesus, that grace has come and that our King has come and he comes for you and he meets you where you really are as a frail creature in need of God's light, life, and love. So let's think about that question again. This Advent, how do we prepare for the coming of Jesus without becoming Pharisees, without adopting that kind of effort, that pride? Well, in one sense, it's simple and it's subtle. It's not about you. <laughs> it's not about you. Those are some of the, that's some of the best good, that's some of the best news I've heard in my life. I framed the problem earlier, preparing for Jesus as a problem of pride versus joy, right? But fortunately, as English speakers, we have a phrase that helps capture the good news of the gospel that we see in this passage. It's pride and joy, or making something your pride and joy. Advent, this season of preparation, invites us to make Jesus, Jesus our pride and joy. Why? Because in Jesus, God is giving us his light, his life, and his love in uh, in exchange and in spite of our darkness, death, and hate. He's meeting us where we are, and we don't have to earn our way there. Our friend St. Augustine describes this, what it looks like to take, uh, make Jesus your pride and joy. He describes it like this. It's as if your eyes are being healed from a form of blindness, and you begin to see a little glimmer of light, and then the next day you see more, and then the next day still more. To you, the light would seem to grow, but the light's perfect, whether you see it or not. 
It's the same with the inner man. You make progress indeed in God, and God seems to be increasing in you, yet you, you yourself are decreasing, that you might fall from your own glory and rise into the glory of God. Friends, the good news is that even our humility is not about us. <laughs> God's grace invites us to receive the leveling humility of the incarnate Jesus and to partake in his elevating resurrection. Dean Pete said it, I think, best last week. God is great. God is good. And the right response we can have in this season to the goodness and the greatness of Jesus is to say he must increase and I must decrease. And I think at this point in the year, we need to recognize that a lot of us, some of us, are ready for 2020 to be over. You can look back at COVID and say, come Lord Jesus. You can look back at injustice and protest and riots and say, come Lord Jesus. You can look back at the political partisanship and say, seriously, come Lord Jesus. But have you, have we considered what God has been preparing for this year? That God has been up to something. We know that God has been working in 2020. It wasn't a waste. He's been naming your idols. He's been naming your pride. He's been unmasking our efforts and our projects for what they really are and what they really, where they really lead to. So don't rush through Advent to get to 2021. It's not going to solve everything. And I don't want us to miss, I don't want you to miss that God is preparing us and has been preparing us for a purpose. And as you journey through this Advent, remember that it's not ultimately about you. Yes, sing carols, pray prayers, send gifts, send cards, light candles, and drink eggnog if that's your thing. And remember that all of those gifts, every last one of them, is from your Father in heaven. Find joy. Find joy this season in the giver of every good gift. And Christian, remember your baptism. Remember those waters the waters of grace that buried you in Christ's death, that leveled you before the foot of the cross, and that raised you with Christ's life, Christ's righteousness, and a new heart. And for those of you who you don't consider yourself a Christian or wouldn't consider yourself religious, that's okay. I'm so happy you're here, and you're invited on this Advent journey too. In fact, we all need to ask, is my pride bringing me joy? Are those efforts where I'm spending my time and finding my value leading to a joy that I can't lose? Are they inviting me into a story that's bigger and that makes sense of the brokenness and the beauty of this world? And if you don't know the answer to that question, that's great. Come, journey with us, seek Jesus with us, and come find what a joy it is not to be the center of the story. Our friend John the Baptist, he was right. He came to prepare a people for Jesus. And while it's true that Advent is not about you, that doesn't mean it's not for you. Like I said, John the Baptist was right. Jesus is the groom. And church, Jesus calls us his bride. It's not about you, but you are someone that Jesus came for. You're someone that Jesus died on the cross for, and you're someone that Jesus rose again to overcome death and bring back to life. And it's in light of that beautiful story, and with humble hearts that we can say this Advent and pray these words. Come, Lord Jesus. Come and prepare our hearts for you. Be our pride and our joy. Amen. Now together, let us uh, stand and declare the goodness and greatness of our God by saying the Nicene Creed together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, non-made, of one being with the Father, Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again. 
in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I now invite you to kneel as able and let us pray for the needs of Christ's church in the world. Let us pray to God, who alone makes us dwell in safety. For all who are affected by coronavirus through illness or isolation or anxiety, that they may find relief and recovery. Lord, in your mercy. For those who are guiding our nation at this time and shaping national policies, that they may make wise decisions. Lord, in your mercy. For doctors, nurses, and medical researchers, that through their skill and insights, many will be restored to health. Lord, in your mercy. For the vulnerable and the fearful, for the gravely ill and the dying, that they may know your comfort and peace. Lord, in your mercy. We commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and protection of God. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. You may now pause the video to offer your own thanksgivings and prayers to the Lord. And now, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor, saying together, Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you please stand? Brothers and sisters, by the grace of God, through his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, we have peace with God, our Father. Therefore, we can have peace with one another. And so, therefore, the peace of the Lord be always with you. I invite you to uh, greet those who are there in your household with a sign of God's peace, uh, or reach out, uh, send a text, send a message, make a phone call to anyone that you love and know and want to reach out to at this time. Very good morning to you all. Uh, let me just bring a few announcements to your attention. Uh, first of all, what a joy it was to celebrate uh, the ordination of our dear brother Tom Hample to the Sacred Order of Priests in Christ's One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church this past week. Um, if you were not able to be with us, uh, fear not. You can still uh, watch and be a part of that. Uh, the, the service was recorded and you can watch that on our YouTube channel. Uh, I just wanna encourage you if, you, if you know Tom, reach out to him and congratulate him uh, as we rejoice uh, that, that the Lord has ordained uh, that man uh, to be a part of the leadership of the church. 
I also want to um, bring a, uh, the, the announcement that, that it is okay to go ahead and start registering for Christmas Eve service. We will be worshiping here in person. We will also be live streaming the service. So you can join us online or in person. If you want to be here in person, go ahead and register now. Uh, all those in your household that will be here and, uh, and be a part of that. Um, also, if you aren't able to be with us during the time when we're live streaming, feel free to watch the recorded um, version of it that will come uh, after the live stream. Also, if you're a, a little one, it's a great day for you because it's a Cathedral Treehouse Day. And so Miss Rachel is ready to meet with our, our little ones and have a wonderful time on Zoom. The link for that is right below this. It will be starting at 1030 today. Uh, since we aren't able to be uh, in worship in person, uh, we're moving it up to 1030. So hope you can be a part of that if you're a little one uh, with your mom and dad. And now we come to the table and we bring our whole selves and we bring our hearts as well as the treasure uh, that the Lord has entrusted to us. And so now ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name, bring offerings and come into his courts. Friends, now as we move to the liturgy of the table, I invite you to um, go find the communion elements that you picked up this week and bring them there into the room with you as we prepare for communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because you sent your beloved Son to redeem us from sin and death and to make us heirs in him of everlasting life, that when he shall come again in power and great glory to judge the world, we may without shame or fear rejoice to behold his appearing. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Father. In your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he broke it 
and gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him so that he may dwell in us and we in him. And bring us with all your saints into the fullness of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as Christ our Savior has taught us, we are bold to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. Dear friends, these are the gifts of God. They are given for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance. Christ died for you, and feed on him in your heart by faith and with thanksgiving. Amen. Now please reverently consume the elements.
In thanksgiving to our gracious God, let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the blessing of God Almighty, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you this day and forever. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. And now let us go forth into the world, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. <laughs>